That's good to me. We're recording. Uh, I'm just going to open up the um, document. Cool. Uh, and, um, yeah. So the um, the um, the point of this of this meetup is to review the load balancer contract, a naive load balancer contract that was written in Rolang. Um, we're going to observe uh, six six primitives of them present in Rolang that are probably familiar to the audience who have um, seen anything about Rolang um, before. Uh, the purpose of this discussion in particular is to observe, to observe concurrent structure and um, maybe even towards the end, Greg Willing, um, show how we can compose an economic rate limiting mechanism into uh, possibly uh, the limiting component of the load balancer contract. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good idea. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. That'd be cool. Um, so I created, uh, just uh, finished probably about 30 seconds ago, just a, uh, a quick diagram that I'll run over for whatever audience is viewing this after. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Good idea. Okay, this is definitely more detailed than the first one I ever created. Um, but uh, as, as, an, as an overarching um, kind of theme, it's important to recognize that, that concurrency, is, especially between larger program components, is a structural property. Um, which allows uh, different programs to, for independently operating processes to uh, coordinate and communicate. Uh, there's a shocking amount of performance that's essentially lost in the time that it spends when one contract is waiting for another to finish while they're blocking each other. Um, so the goal of concurrent design is to um, utilize as much or as little time as possible and to allow each program to operate as independently as possible while still offering um, um, structural properties that, that enable communication. So once you have all the pieces of a uh, concurrent program that are operating independently, um, you have to have a way for them to communicate. And um, in uh, the message passing paradigm, and specifically the row calculus model, which we use, um, processes communicate through named channels. And um, just, I guess, as an example, uh, or as, as beginning, let's let's talk about each of these components. So the four that we uh, recognize, and and this is obviously an extremely naive. This this is just the bare bones um, representation of what, or, or of how these different contracts are communicating with each other. Um, we have a collector, uh, which kind of spins. It kind of sits and waits for a client request, which is going to be sent in. Um, and we have a dispatcher which kind of spins in the loop, waiting for uh, the request to be forwarded from the collector. When the dispatcher is initialized, actually, um, it's going to take um, a certain or an, an amount of, uh, of workers as a parameter. Um, so the actual parameter there is going to specify how many different workers we're going to create. And a worker is, is essentially just a process that's going to evaluate the work request that the client sends. Um, so again, when the dispatcher is initialized, we create as many workers as we want. Um, and then what we're going to do, and this is the first occurrence that we have of, of an actual message being passed. Whoa, hello. <laughs> um, we, see that, uh, we, see that, we see that when we initialize uh, each worker, uh, it is parametized on, 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 on two levels. On, on, and each of these are channels. It's parametized on a work channel. And on a worker shoot on on a worker queue channel, the work channel is going to be the place where a worker actually receives a request. Okay, and again, that's going to be the one that's forwarded from the collector. The uh, worker queue is going to be uh, the place where we store the channels of the workers, right? Because after we have after we've initialized a multiplicity of workers, we have to have a way for the dispatcher to communicate. So what we see here is actually the dispatcher adding each worker as each worker is initialized to a worker queue, all right? And this channel is, and, and just to be clear, this channel, right, that we're sending each worker to or each worker channel to is a location in memory, in this representation anyway. 
uh, channels are an abstract notion, so they can represent uh, some many forms of location, but in this case, uh, we can think about them at least in the beginning as uh, a location in memory. Um, and so, so we're storing each of these workers on a worker queue, right? You know, uh, Joseph, the, the, other, the other place to look at this is also in your diagram over here where you're on the left. Um, yes, yeah, exactly, the yeah. Because right? yep. that's where, uh, if you could move your diagram, there we go. Yeah. yeah. So, so between, the, um, between the client request, which is happening at the node channel, and the collector mm -hmm. um, uh, listener, Mm -hmm. which is the four comprehension. So there, uh, you know, you can, I don't, I guess that's right. not pretty sure, but if you move your mouse to, to two where it says node bang, yeah, and then over to three where it mm -hmm. says from node, yeah, right, that's, that's kind of the most basic communication, right? Totally, yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I was, the only reason I was starting on this side is because it's, uh, we have to know that these guys are initialized first, but yes, that's an excellent, that's a, that's a great point. So this, um, so uh, to reiterate, this is the basic form of communication. It's like a little, it's, it's like a little uh, conversation that's happening between uh, two separate processes. Um, and these processes are, processes are both operating concurrently. Um, those familiar with Scala will notice that, um, the implementation of a Scala, Scala 4 comprehension um, with no being the generator. And as we said before, similar to the worker uh, Q channel over here, uh, on this channel, node, bang, we're going to send a new work request um, and the work request will possess an address, which is a return channel and a process to be evaluated. Uh, so these two operate concurrently. Uh, so an, an important part of that is that the collector and client processes obviously are not going to be one line <laughs> each like this. Uh, in fact, these small, uh, these small processes, the four comprehension and the bang over here are just small, uh, small processes within a much more complex process. But the important point is that the, this is the place node essentially in memory or uh, the location where these two, uh, where these two meet, it's where they synchronize. Aside from that, um, these processes in this depiction anyway, operate relatively independently. Um, which means, that, yeah, it doesn't have to be in memory, right? No, no. It doesn't have to be, no, no. These, these can, in fact, be, I mean, ultimately, they will meet up in memory in some process running on some machine. Yeah. But, but the, 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 the node channel itself is an abstract location. Exactly. And, and you know, this can be, uh, you know, they can, client and collector can be separated by the internet. Exactly. So it could, yeah, it could be on the network level, say if we're use, uh, using um, an AMPQ uh, or um, whatever other form of IP uh, sockets, anything essentially. Um, so yeah, it's, it's an abstract notion. Um, uh, but yeah, so, so the important point is that uh, this is essentially where these two processes, regardless of how they are communicating, synchronize. Um, so then let's, let's run through this uh, sequentially then. <clears throat> Um, so we're going to begin with a client. A client is going to send essentially to Node. And the reason I named it Node is because I'm assuming, or um, in, in my when I was imagining this, I'm, I'm imagining that uh, a client is on, uh, how, however a client's issuing a, a request, and then they're going to send it to a Node operator. Um, uh, just a client, standard client Node uh, interface. So the Client sends a new work request that has a return address and a process to be evaluated to the collector. The collector's job is to um, steadily hand the correct work request to the dispatcher. Uh, so the four comprehension here says that for a message coming in on the node channel, we're going to match that message. And a message in, in this case is, um, is a generic pattern. Um, which we can pattern match against, hence message match. Uh, so we could check against uh, a number of properties. Um, so uh, we could check against uh, maybe termination. Um, we could check for uh, typing. We could check, check for um, a certain data, data stream or, or uh, data safety qualities. Uh, essentially, any, any thing that you can pattern match against, we're able to in this section. So, so the four comprehension here acts as a bit of a filter uh, for whatever work requests are coming in on the collector so that we 
so that we can make sure by the time that the dispatcher gets it, that the dispatcher doesn't have to expend uh, resources, um, either diverting through an error request or, or, or error handling itself. Well, one thing that you, you might consider in this presentation is it's a little um, jarring for, the, uh, for those people who are familiar with the match style syntax to have the close brace there when you've got the case yeah. right under it. So you might want to put that close brace down below four. Oh yeah, I didn't even realize that. So, so mm -hmm. we're right, right, right to the right of match, you have a closed brace and you could put that down below four and that would, that would you know, um, it would still match your flow, but it would also match the legal syntax. Yeah, here I can, I can fix that right now. Um, <clears throat> Like this? No, you want to put it actually below four because the case is inside the, the match. Yeah, oh, below four, yeah, okay. I thought you meant directly below, yeah. yeah below number four as opposed to below the four comprehension. Yeah, yeah. And, yep. and yeah, exactly. Yep. And in fact, you, you have another, um, you have another closed brace that you can put in. I mean, I don't, I don't mean to get too. So no, that's, it's fine. The match actually has an open brace, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, ju just to the right of match, you'd have an open brace. Yeah, right. And then, and then, and then that 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 brace that you just put in the close brace that closes the the match, right? Mm -hmm. So we got a bingo right there. And then you have a yeah, exactly. And that that's slightly less jarring to the eye. But you know, I understood what you meant. Yeah, um, I'm just yeah. worried that people who are not used to, uh, who don't really know the row syntax inside and out, they, they might be confused. Sure. Yeah, we wouldn't want that. Um, <clears throat> all right. Cool. Um, so again, uh, those familiar with Scala will recognize the use of a Scala uh, case class here, um, and hence, hence matching. So we're going to match this message against a, a series of cases, and we're going to, um, and whichever, you know, course matches, obviously that's the uh, respective uh, informally universe that, that we're going to follow. Um, so work request here, uh, as we sent it, is actually bound to uh, a variable work request. And this is because work request itself is, is an object. And in the contract that I can show later, um, it's, or it's, it's, it's a structure with, with a series of fields. So uh, we bind that to work request in order uh, to essentially just pass it around more efficiently. Um, and, and as we noticed, we have, uh, again, the work request has an address and process. So what's been matched against here is uh, likely that the address is in proper format and the process is one that this collector dispatcher is set to handle. <clears throat> so in the case that we do match this work request, um, we are going to send the request to the uh, work queue that the dispatcher is listening on, and that's over here. Uh, we're also, and uh, again, since this is a, a very, very bare bones uh, representation, um, we haven't given the parameters that uh, the actual parameters that collector will take, but it will take parameters. Um, so while we send work request to the worker queue channel or to the work queue channel, we're going to simultaneously recurse collector so that it can take another uh, work request. And in fact, this program, the collector, the collector protocol will uh, employ a rate limitation mechanism, uh, which we briefly mentioned earlier. That's not represented here, uh, but we have to make sure that the dispatcher is never overloaded. Um, so to do that, uh, the implementation that, that, that I've written anyway is just a, a, a bare accumulator. Um, but in reality, the rate limitation mechanism would likely be some sort of, uh, it would be correlated to some analysis of whatever computational resources that the node operator is bringing to the table, um, and which the collector will take as a parameter, as a limitation, when it's initialized. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. So again, um, the same pattern that we witnessed here with the node channel, bang, four, is being repeated here with work queue uh, or with, yeah, sending a work request to the work queue channel, we have the dispatcher listening for a work request, that same work, work request on the same channel. But uh, we actually noticed something else, and this is the, um, an implementation of a joint semantics that, that Roland uses. We can specify 
uh, that we witness multiple input on mul or uh, input on multiple channels before we execute the following handle before we do the continuation. Um, so in this case, not only, or in the case of the dispatcher, not only do we need to see a work request on the work queue that's given by the collector, but we need to see the work channel of a worker on the worker queue. So we can read this as for a work request coming in on the work queue channel and for a worker on the worker queue channel, pull a worker off and hand it the work request. So essentially, we're just kind of passing around this work request. Um, again, we're, we're passing around this work request to different components, but again, because these are only smaller protocols within much larger processes, they can operate independently aside from these points of synchronization, um, which, which means that sequential processing, or we're not, we're not handed the traditional bot bottlenecks of sequential processing. <clears throat> um, so here we're going to send, as I said before, the work request to the work channel of the worker. And again, as we saw on the side, we're gonna recurse so that we can take another, just as we did with the collector. And this is when our, um, our workers come into play. So after we send the work request to the worker, again, we're recognizing the same pattern, although this time we're reusing it as a case, um, as, a, as a case class. Um, so if we have the case that a work request is witnessed on the work channel of a worker, so if the worker witnesses a work request, then we're gonna execute, or sorry, we're gonna evaluate the process. And this was the process that was actually specified all the way back here when we initialized the, the process. That was given as a parameter. We're gonna evaluate the process and we're going to send it on the return address given by the work request. So this is simply an evaluation, which, and, and it's depicted again by this, by this <laughs> arrow at the bottom, right? We're just sending it straight back to the client. So now, one, one, thing to, one thing to be aware mm -hmm. is if, if proc is an honest to God proc as opposed to a value, mm -hmm. uh, that star proc is really, um, to, to get it to evaluate, you'd have that star proc outside of the, the sending of the result, and you'd have to demand that the proc give you an address to synchronize on. And the reason, the reason is because, um, uh, this is the reflection mechanism, right? So star proc is just going to put the process there. It's not actually going to evaluate it and it's going to send it over to address, right? So this is a, this is a subtlety in the syntax. So to actually evaluate the thing, you'd have to have that outside. I don't have access to um, the, I don't have access to the, the diagram, but I'll type it in the chat. So you, you'd want something like this. Right. Um, the star proc, uh, you can leave this diagram up, that's fine. Uh, it, it's helpful for me to, to read it off. Uh, it's going back to you though. I'm not seeing the diagram, I'm just seeing you. Oh, all right. Let me screen share again. And there. Cool. Okay, so, so you, you, you'd write, ooh, yeah, okay, that's cool. You'd write something like star proc, um, and, um, and, and we, we, you have to arrange a protocol for the return value, dot adder, uh, bang, and then whatever the value is. So, so let's assume, just for purposes of discussion, let's assume that star proc um, uh, knows a, uh, has, a, has a, a value address. Sure. Okay. So there's a, both sides have the value address, and we could we could work out that little protocol separately. But so it would be so for v from uh, val adder, and there's actually a, a, an interesting point here that I've been thinking a lot about this week, actually, um, and that would be v, and then uh, close paren, and then you continue with the worker dot worker q. You bang worker dot work uh, and so that would be I just typed it in the chat okay. uh, and so so the assumption there is that when proc runs 
it knows to send to the val adder the value. And then you have to arrange how it got, how the two agree on va the val adder channel. Um, how proc and the client agree on the val adder channel? Uh, uh, how, how proc and, um, and this piece of code agree on val adder channel. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, so pr potentially that would, potentially that could be um, handled at, uh, the work request yeah. uh, object, give, it, right. give it the val adder channel and, and then proc has to be organized so that it knows to do um, and so you see you see the transformation that we've done you know yeah. we've basically taken your line and modified it by by pulling the proc out mm -hmm. and putting a v there and then wrapping that whole thing inside of for comprehension yeah, and then instead of handing uh, proc directly to the return address, we're just handling the value that proc yields to. Exactly. And, and notice that proc, uh, you can just start running proc. So proc will run. It, if it computes a value, it will ship that down the, the, the val adder channel. That will be down to V, and then that will be hand, handed off. Yeah. I see. That, okay, cool. That's, that actually makes a lot more sense. Because otherwise, we're just kind of shipping this process from the work. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's right. Yeah. But, but yeah, cool. Cool. All right. Excellent. So that's the actual evaluation of the, all right. Yeah. So, okay. Well, that's also an important, important thing to add is that um, up, up until this point, until we just recognized that, all we were really doing is, is moving around the process between components in order to, to put them in the ideal configuration for parallel uh, processing. So um, it's kind of important about this, uh, about this one case, right, is that each of these workers um, are potentially taking work requests on their respective worker queues uh, or, and on their work channels uh, simultaneously. So as each dispatcher or as, as uh, the dispatcher handles each request, it hands it off to the worker. And notice that the worker actually doesn't have to communicate back to the dispatcher um, to tell it that it's done, uh, which is what this little snippet here is about. Um, in parallel, so as we evaluate the process, um, we're actually going to send the worker queue, um, or we're gonna send the worker queue of the worker, or sorry, the work channel of the worker uh, to the worker queue, which the dispatcher holds. So we're gonna add the channel that the worker can be communicated with on um, back to the dispatcher. So essentially, if a, if a worker is busy, its channel is not available to the dispatcher. And when a worker is no longer busy, its channel is again available with the dispatcher. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't uh, explicitly have to say I'm done with the dispatch or to the dispatcher and have the dispatcher send it back to the client. It communicates directly back to the client with the results here. Um, so all of these are kind of operating uh, in parallel, which means that the work requests that we're getting uh, for each work request, we can kind of just spin off a new worker and um, and essentially batch process uh, transactions. So uh, the last the last portion of this, um, the simultaneously we tell the dispatcher that uh, we finished and we add our channel back to the dispatcher, and then we uh, send the result of our evaluation all the way back to the client. And the client, as we're as as we're probably uh, picking up fairly simply or fairly easily by now, is waiting. Uh, as implemented a for comprehension, waiting for a result on the return channel that is actually the return address we gave in the new uh, work request. Um, so after or, or upon, upon a client receiving a result, it's going to send the result off for a, a gate check. And the gate check in this case is just a, a suitability check that the answer or that the uh, node response is the response that we're looking for and it's, it's one that's appropriate. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. No, that's so, nice. I mean, I, you, could, you could probably clean this up a little bit so that there is some, you know, um, readability stuff. Like, you, you, um, like, I think, you know, if we were to go through the code, we've got adder here and return here. We might just rewrite the code a little bit so that the, whatever variable is used here is the same. And it's easier yeah. for the eyes to pick up. In the same way that node here is the same as node here. Yeah, we, we did that. Um, we did that for, for, for a different reason. It's because, uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure, but, but I guess that this was, that this was a, a formal parameter and this was uh, an actual parameter that, that we had. 
yeah, yeah, ex exactly, exactly. I'm just saying we could we could rewrite the code, sh shuffle variable names around so that they line up again. Yeah, exactly. Um, that would that would be cleaner. Uh, there, there, there's a little bit of stuff here that where I would I wouldn't do the double braces. I'd put them on separate lines, but that's like that's minor cosmetic stuff. Yeah. But uh, no, this this is a nice this is a nice way to talk about it. Um, um, oh, oh, yeah. Um, I don't want to forget. I don't want to forget um, some of the, the cool points that you pointed out, uh, Greg, last time. Um, I guess. I guess I would ask, uh, how would you? How would the, the behavioral type story fit into into this structure? Oh yeah. So so one one thing that you want to uh, one place where you have a potential race condition mm -hmm. is over at the collector. Um, so right there, notice that you, you, there's a race in the sense that the, the collector could start processing messages again before the work request is on the work queue. Exactly. Yeah. I've been curious. Uh, so you can, so you could insist, um, that there is a, uh, a hand. It, so this is currently asynchronous output, right? So in order to, in order to synchronize this, You'd have to put a um, you'd have to put a, a little handshake there with the work queue, which mm -hmm. is you know um, here it is and here's a return address to let me know that you got it and once I know that you've got it, then I can I can relaunch the collector. Then I oh so that's um that's kind of like a like a two phase commit. Yeah, so it's 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 a, it's a yeah it's it's basically just a handshake. It's like. Yeah. You know, I'm not. I'm not going to go forward with launching any other processes until. And so now, now you have these two different possible behaviors, right? You have a behavior where you can launch the collector right away, and you have a behavior where the co collector is synchronized, or is, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, it's synchronized with respect to the the handing of the work request to the work queue. And so you can write a behavioral type, which either says it's okay for these to be, you know running along in parallel, or another type which says, no, no, the collector can't fire until after you've got the handshake done. Um, that, that's, that's an example of where this kind of stuff would, would fit in. Uh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so uh, another, another point that you, uh, a couple cool points that you made um, last time were on the power of the, uh, on the four comprehension, on, on the joint semantics of the four comprehension. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, a, a great example that you used was that these two um, don't, I mean, there's, there's nothing barring them from being any other components. These could be a buyer and seller requests coming in uh, simultaneously on uh, for comprehension and if they're witnessed um, and they fit certain criteria because this doesn't actually implement the if con um, that would normally go right here after the worker queue. So we can say that for um, blank coming in on this channel, and for blank also witnessed on this channel, if they fit these conditions uh, and implement an if con here, then execute the handle. Um, so these could be buyer seller requests. These could be, uh, f and, and, and the, essentially they're unlimited. They could be every data ticker on Bloomberg that's coming in uh, as, yeah. as each live data feed. These could be uh, feeds coming in, uh, the telemetry feeds from a, from a race car at the Monaco Grand Prix. Um, these could be essentially any live data feeds that we can all just kind of uh, filter through and uh, almost almost like with a lens on different levels and and find which configuration we actually need to execute uh, some predetermined process, uh, which is an extremely powerful idea. Um, additionally, yeah. yeah. I mean, one one of the one of the things that I, you know I like you know uh, add I call to. Um, and uh, Navneed have been working on their um, their freelance marketer um, yeah. freelance market. So again, that could be you know instead of buyer and seller, it could be request for work, right? And and a request for a worker, which is very similar to to this, except that now it's it's um, it's a human request, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. So so it's a, it, again, is basically you, that line or that. Uh, um, um, point 0.5 there is kind of the heart of lively gig. Right. You, you could build all of lively gig starting from the middle from that and then, and then working out. Yeah, that's, that's very cool. Um, you also, you also mentioned briefly that, um, 
that these workers could be, I mean, they could be obvious, obviously specialized um, per dispatcher and per collector. So um, we actually have a, a collector and dispatcher for requests that would go to a collector and dispatcher for each dispatcher that we want to handle a different type of um, request per namespace, say, if, um, because right. there's, there's a chance that any node operator would operate multiple instances of uh, row VM under different namespaces. So each of these could potentially exist and multiple, um, multiple protocols like this could exist on the system and on the machine level for different namespaces, all occurring simultaneously, all processing um, each of these requests simultaneously. In addition, each of these workers um, uh, could be cached um, such, such that we get the, um, and I guess we're kind of, if, if we had that conversation, we'd kind of uh, diverge into special K, which, which maybe we should keep it brief this time, but um, essentially the, the notion of locality on a network of these particular workers um, in a distributed, uh, in a distributed setting would allow for, for much greater performance leaps. Um, yeah, so. absolutely. Yeah, right. I mean, so, so you can imagine you have namespace, uh, you know, a separate namespace for processing video and a separate namespace for processing audio. Yeah. Uh, a separate namespace for processing uh, um, uh, text-based content, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, that, that, uh, and, then, and then these kind of load balance infrastructures uh, become super important. Exactly, yeah. Um, yeah, cool. Um, well, anything else uh, did, did, that you wanted to go over? Did you, did you want to take a look at the actual code? Or uh, I, I personally think that this is uh, sufficient. I, I uh, think this is absolutely sufficient. I mean, w w the one thing that we might, c might consider is, is just that if, if you, that there's something very similar here but um, uh, to the, the kind of design pattern that's used in the source-to-source -source translation for adding uh, uh, phlogiston to um, contracts. Oh, so, yeah, yeah, let's talk about that. Uh, right, second. right, so, so essentially, you know, um, uh, what, what you're, you're, you're utilizing the fact that every process can be shipped, or the, the processes can be shipped around. Exactly. Right? And then, and then the, the phlogiston um, uh, injector for lack of a better word, um, uh, utilizes the same trick. What it says is, I can turn every process into a process that, that won't take a step, uh, or that the, the, uh, the, every step is, is gated by, you know, first you package up the continuation, and then you check some condition, in this case, the, the presence of sufficient phlogiston. And then if you've met that condition, then you can go ahead and run it. Right, and that's that's essentially the same sort of trick you've done here, and you can, you can apply you can now compose your trick with that trick. Yeah, did so, you want to? Is the work that you've done on it uh, ready to be viewed yet? Or right, sure, yeah, of course. I mean, I, I've made I've made the document public. If you want to let me grab, yeah, um, yeah just uh, as we're as we're leaving this. So uh, just to recap, the uh, collector uh, uh, the collector protocol here, as it, as it's written now, implements a, a, a naive uh, accumulator. Um, that's based on nothing but um, a numerical count of how many work requests are being processed currently. And if it reaches whatever, some arbitrary amount, then uh, we're going to shut the collector down and reject requests until we find out that, um, until we find out that, that more workers are available. So right now that's just uh, an accumulator based on integers. And uh, Greg's discussing a, um, something that we can implement uh, as, as an if conditional uh, right here. So for message coming on node, uh, potentially if you have this much phlogiston, right, and phlogiston is like the gas that Ethereum has, it's a rate limiting mechanism on our chain, then continue, then execute the handle. Um, so let's look at what you have. Okay. Oh, so yeah, there we go. Yep. Uh, share screen. Okay, cool. So there's a, there's a little um, note which people can are, are you know free to go take a look at. I'll just make sure that they have a link there. Um, I wrote this note back in 2014, by the way. Um, and uh, I, while I was at the, uh, the Bitcoin scaling conference. And I will go ahead and, where's the, there we go. I'll go to the chat and put the link in there so people can look at this document at their leisure. Um, and then um, basically I'll just scroll down to the important bits right here. 
So, so the the idea is that there's um, for every um, for every um, uh, process, there's a, a for every contract um, in the system, there's an execution harness, and the execution harness constitutes the, the phlogiston schedule or the gas schedule, and that harness is parametric. So, M N is the uh, is the thing that um, uh, is the execution harness, so it's, it's essentially the gas schedule, and N is the supply of gas, right? And there are three, there, there are essentially three um, um, uh, 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 channels that are, are, are uh, parameter. One is the nozzle, um, which is injecting the phlogiston into the, the, um, the setup, right? So it comes with a certain amount of phlogiston, the nozzle is where you receive the phlogiston, and then, um, and then uh, the phlogiston uh, channel is where you check to see if you've got enough phlogiston to take a step. And the step is where you receive um, the, the, uh, the, the piece of the uh, work to be done. So the step is where you would, is akin to, what did you call it, node? Um, to receive the work request. Yeah, yeah, node. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so then um, essentially the, the, the work harness uh, or the, the yeah the execution harness is is um, right here and it's basically um, how much phlogiston you've got right so that's a big par right here that's the supply of phlogiston and here you have um, you have the the um, schedule which is if it's got some phlogiston then it's willing to to do some new steps. Um, mm -hmm. And so essentially what it does is it sends on the step channel um, some of the phlogiston that it's received and a return channel for the work. And then, and then it waits on the return channel for the, the step that it's going to run. Right. Gotcha. And, and so that's, that's, uh, and it's very, very trivial, right? There's, there's nothing to it. Um, yeah. And then all we have to do then is, is for the core pieces of the row, uh, uh, row calculus, which is sitting in the center of row lang. Um, we just do a translation from, um, you know, the, the, the basic elements. So here I've, I've utilized the question mark instead of the, instead of the, um, yeah, so that's one thing that, that uh, uh, I wasn't using the four comprehension syntax here, but I can, I can easily just quickly rewrite that. So that becomes um, uh, Zork. So that's four. Logiston from nozzle. That's the four comprehension. And then here it would be the same. Here it would be um, four K from return. And then just for grins, we'll We'll make this slightly more readable. There we go. And then, so so this is the same here. So this would be um, for y from x to p, and uh, here this is for the phlogiston and the return from the step. And that shows how you can receive structured data. And then likewise, um, here this becomes for y from x do, do the p. Right, so you can see essentially um, in, in each of these particular cases, um, uh, what, what's happening is we're just pushing the translation through. So the translation is parametric in the step channel, right? And when you have, when you have a four comprehension, the translation of the four comprehension given this step channel is weight on the step channel for the phlogiston and the return, and then return um, this, which is essentially this process that's been translated so that will push through uh, we should have should have passed along the step channel um, 
uh, 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 so you you um, send on the return channel um, the for comprehension that is this one, but with p translated to include um, to include the 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 um, phlogiston harness, the phlogiston schedule. So if you look up here, what that would happen is this translation is going to show up in um, the return channel that will be bound to K and that's what we'll start running. And, and, and the same is true for, for each of these, right? So it's, it's easy to see that the, um, the parallel composition is just the parallel composition of the translations um, and, and so forth. And I'll go ahead and fix all these up to use the four comprehension notation later. The important, the important point, we're just about out of time. The important point is that you can prove um, that um, in the presence of sufficient gas, the, uh, the target of the translation is bisimilar to the source of the translation. So we start with an ordinary Roland contract. We, we inject it in, with a gas schedule. And what we want to know is that with sufficient gas, these two programs are the same. They better be, right? Because if there was something that you were doing with the gas schedule that was somehow different, right, mm -hmm. then the semantics of this contract doesn't match the semantics of this contract, and then it would be hard to reason about uh, uh, contract semantics. And so, this, go ahead. So can we use the, um, you, you spoke to me before about an extended calculus uh, or row calculus, which encodes standard arithmetic operations. Um, would we, be able to encode in the row calculus um, a decrement of the uh, phlogiston value per step that's that's taken. Yeah, in this particular case, I, I don't have to worry about that. In the same way that you have the worker queues, um, uh, sorry, the, the workers tied up and not available if they if they've yanked away their their channel. Mm. I've, I've done the same trick here. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's only so much phlogiston floating around, and if it's if it's yanked, then it's not put back, and so it's steadily decreasing. Yeah. Okay. Oh, so, I see. So, yeah. So I, 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 that was just a little trick, right? I mean, but yes, we, the short answer to your question is yes. Of course, we can, we can, we can do that, right? And that's that's kind of the um, the the beauty of having a, a modular uh, semantics like this, so we can. Mm -hmm. We know how to do the arithmetic in uh, row calculus, but we don't have to do it in, in row calculus. Sure. Right. Yeah. All right, that's, that's excellent. So that's a recap on, a, um, on an economic rate limitation mechanism that can be injected into uh, contracts. Um, so again, this um, entire session has been on writing a load balancer um, for managing a distributed, um, a distributed system based on uh, uh, Rolang, which is the contracting language that uh, our chain uses to uh, traverse the blockchain. Um, uh, Greg, uh, do you want to give a quick update on this, the status of, of the VM while we have an audience? Or oh yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so, so I mean, the the, the VM uh, right now, I'm working on the compiler, right? right. So yeah. the source to source compiler is actually coming along quite nicely. We we are. are um, in the midst of uh, setting up a test harness so that I can start testing the compiler. Uh, okay. We have enough of the code written that we can compile the, um, we can compile the, the, the hello world examples in the Rolang spec. Um, and then um, I've done a handoff to uh, Kent, um, who wants to take on to do the, um, take it on to do the clean room implementation of the VM. So that is an actual update on the VM itself. Uh, so I, I handed him my BNF uh, for the um, uh, for the opcodes, mm -hmm. um, and so that's kind of that. Again, it's one of these you know build it from the middle out. You know, if you if you have a, a good representation for the opcodes, then then writing the virtual machine is pretty much straightforward. Especially since we already have an implementation of the virtual machine in C plus plus. So basically, just yeah port that C++ over to Scala, where the, where the representation of the opcodes was automatically generated from the BNFC. Nice. Yeah. Well, cool. All right. Uh, well, thanks for your time, Greg. Um, and thank you, Joseph. This is, uh, as always, a, a pleasure, and I, I'm really grateful that you organized this. Yeah. Sure. Greg, yeah. Greg um, I'm going to stop recording now. Can I